All right. You guys doing good? Okay. Well, welcome to the factory. If this is your first time, we're happy that you're with us. If uh, you are returning because you were here last week or you come every week, welcome back. If you're just coming back for the first time in a while, we're happy that you're with us as well. And uh, yeah, we're excited. It's a good night to be here. We're starting a new series. And um, well, it's, it's a new series, but it's an old series. It's Facts Part 2. And uh, we did this series uh, maybe like, I think it was, that's what I was going to say, November 2020. Thanks, Shane. Um, November 2020, which was a year and a half. Oh, my gosh, it's 2022. Wow. Things are happening. Well, yeah, so uh, almost a year and a half ago. So facts, frequently asked questions. Now, we're doing it a little bit different this time. Um, whereas before, we sort of posed questions um, and uh, answered them, or it was really sort of a collection of questions that I had been uh, asked or that we sort of as a team had been talking about. This time we're doing a different where we're sort of asking you guys questions, primarily through social media. We're collecting those answers, and then we're seeking to answer the question to the best of our ability. Because really, when the question was posed, we got a lot of questions back. And um, so we're talking about some of our maybe frequently asked questions or how we answer maybe frequently asked questions. So if you have a Bible, you can turn two places tonight or one, and then we'll get to the second one uh, later, or you can follow along on the screen. We're gonna be in Ephesians 2, um, actually one of the verses that Alexa read tonight. Um, and then 1 John 2. It's actually interesting. Last week uh, with Peyton's student share, I felt like it was spot on with Pastor Jude's message. And then tonight with Alexa's student share, it was like spot on with tonight's message. So God is good. He works, um, he works all the time. I think the way we sort of put God in a box sometimes and how he works. Um, but God works all the time throughout every, like every situation in our life. God is working. And there's a song that we sing that even if we don't see it, even if we don't feel it, he's still working. And I think we need to know that even in the little details of our life, like putting on Alexa's heart to share something tonight and what God had ordained for us to talk about tonight, because God is working. And I think sometimes we just want to say God works in only certain ways, but God is working in even the little details of our lives. Um, so Ephesians 2, frequently asked questions, and tonight... Um, this question is this, what is the most difficult thing about being a Christian? What is the most difficult thing about being a Christian? I think we have a slide. We asked this question and uh, we got some of your answers and we'll leave that up. We're not going to break down all of them, but we sort of categorized these questions or these answers that we received and we're going to talk about for us what is some of the most difficult things about being a Christian. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at, at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show uh, the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now we're going to jump to 1 John 2, verse 14. It says this, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
and the pride of life, and it comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would open up our eyes now, and as we seek to answer probably a difficult question, what, why is walking with you at times so hard and so difficult? Lord, would you reveal yourself to us, your goodness to us, your kindness to us, like we read in Ephesians 2. And help us to see that walking with you, although it may be difficult, God, you are always worth it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. One time I was playing basketball at the IG Center. I used to, I haven't been going so much anymore, but Thursday mornings I'd go play basketball at the IG, shout out IG Center. Um, one time I was there and there was a short white guy with um, <laughs> ankle weights on trying to dunk. Short white guy with ankle weights trying to dunk. And I can tell you he was not even close. Not even close. Now, you look at that situation and, and immediately you go like, well, maybe if you took off the ankle weights, that would help. Your problem is the ankle weights. The reality is the problem wasn't the ankle weights. The problem was he was a short white guy trying to dunk. Even if he got rid of the ankle weights, he would still be a short white guy trying to dunk. And I think sometimes the reason I bring this up is because it's easy for us to maybe identify what we think is a problem. Like, hey, buddy, if you took off the ankle weights, you'd be good. But that, that, that's, that's sort of like, it's not all of the story. There's, there, it was deeper than that. It was bigger than that. He had a problem that wasn't just the ankle weights. You know what I'm saying? There's a problem like, hey, you're going to have to work really, 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 really. Like, it's going to be more than ankle weights that are going to get you strong enough and big enough and tall enough for you to be able to dunk on the rim. You tracking with me? Sometimes when we think about the difficulty with walking with God, we sort of assign the problem to the wrong thing. We think that the problem is this, or we think that the problem is that person over there. Or we think that the problem is something going on within us. Or we think that the problem is Christianity is just too hard. And sometimes if we misidentify the problem, we won't be able to find a solution. Are you with me? And oftentimes when walking with God and when difficulty comes in walking with God, we are quick to misidentify the problem. And if we have the wrong problem, we can't find the right solution. And so it's important for us when walking with God to be able to define or identify what actually is the problem. Now let me talk about what our problem is. It's three things. We read about it in Ephesians 2. The problem is the flesh, the world, and the devil. The problem, what makes Christianity hard, what makes it difficult to walk with God is these three simple things. The flesh, the world, and the devil. Our problem isn't just someone or something or some situation. For instance, our problem is not a mean classmate. Our problem isn't our anxiety. Our problem isn't our parents fighting at home. Now, let me be honest, those things don't help, right? That annoying, mean classmate that makes fun of you for every time you open your Bible app or you, you, you're planning on going to church or, or just pressures you to do things that maybe you don't feel comfortable doing or, or you're, the, the, the problem of you feeling anxious and overwhelmed or the problem with difficulty at home or with friends and things like that, that definitely doesn't help our walk with God, but that isn't our problem. Ephesians 2 tells us that our problem is, is bigger than that. It's deeper than that. The Bible will tell us in other places that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, meaning the Christian struggle is not with people. It's something beyond that. It's something behind the scenes that we can't see. And even though we can't see it, doesn't make it not real. And so we need to understand that the primary problem, what makes our 
walk with God often difficult is these three things, our flesh, the world, the devil. Let's break these things down. First, our flesh. The flesh is the part of us that wants to keep us in charge. It's the part of us that doesn't want to surrender to King Jesus. It's the part of us that even though when we sing like, God, you alone are worthy of our praise and I want to follow you with my life. And even though we declare these things, there's an inside part of us that's like, okay, Jesus, I'll give you the throne sometimes, but other days of the week, I'm still king or queen. I'm in charge. This is me. And like, Jesus, you can have part of my life or some days of my life. But then there's the flesh, the inside part of us that says, do you know what? I think I'm still going to be in charge. So we have the flesh, it's us. Then there's the world. The world is the systems of the world that live in opposition to God. The world is not like trees and, and the cosmos, like the planets in the sky. And, and it's not even the people in our world. The problem is systems or, 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 or groups or ideas that set themselves in opposition to God. And then the third is the devil. The, the scripture we just read calls him the prince of the power of the air. And he wants to keep you from God. And if he can't keep you from God, he wants to keep you from being used by God. The Bible talks about the devil, that he is like a roaring lion, that he's on, he's on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. And if you know anything about how lions hunt and kill, they don't ta- attack uh, uh, animals in groups. They watch the slow, weak one until they get alone, and then they attack. And the enemy is a lot like that. He doesn't like you. In fact, he hates your guts. He wants nothing but to kill, steal, and destroy your life. He wants to keep you from ever walking in God's goodness or favor or plans and purposes. And so he is on the hunt, looking for a moment of weakness for you to trip you up or tempt you or distract you or keep you from ever walking in the things of God. And he is a very real threat as you walk with God. So the three primary things that we're dealing with is our flesh, the world, And the devil. And this manifests itself in all types of ways that make walking with God difficult. But before we break down, like, the specific things that we're dealing with, we gotta recognize what our problem is. Because if, if you're going around thinking that your problem with your Christ, like problem with your Christianity or walking with God is the fact that your, uh, uh, your friends mean to you or a family member sick or, or, or you're dealing some sort of anxious way, if you think that that's the problem, you're not going to be able to find the right solution. Are you with me? And so just as a foundation, before we break down some simple things, I just want us to say there there is something real going on, oftentimes behind the scenes, that is actually the real threat to the Christian. And so when we ask questions like, what's the most difficult thing? And we say, well, it's my classmate that, that makes fun of me for being a Christian. Absolutely. But that falls into the category of the world that is being, what we're told, controlled by the prince of the power of the air. It's it's bigger than just that person in your class. And we need to recognize the problem. Now, when we asked this question on Instagram, we sort of got three sort of categories of answers to those questions. And we're going to sort of lump those, these things together and try to break them down. The first sort of category was personal. The, the, the biggest problem to my Christian walk or my walk with God is me, <laughs> In a couple ways. One, what's difficult is overcoming personal sin and having spiritual growth. One of the things that makes walking with God so difficult, no offense to you, is you. One of the things that makes walking with God so difficult for me is me. And, And if we spend our whole life blaming other people for why we're struggling we're never gonna be able to overcome what's going on inside of us. And so there's things that that we deal with, personal sin, personal temptation, threats, and things that we deal with on the inside, maybe some of which nobody even knows about. But there's things that are going on inside of us that this is, one for me, the, the biggest threat to my spiritual growth right now is me. 
Maybe it's because I'm short-tempered. Maybe it's because I'm constantly giving into temptation. Maybe it's because I'm, I, I'm so caught up in what I'm thinking or feeling that I can't move. And it's me. It's, it's personal. And one of the things that makes beca- or, or walking with God difficult is our own personal uh, ability to overcome sin. Or in other words, the difficult thing is becoming like Jesus. This idea of sanctification. Now, let me just begin by saying we all sin and we all continue to sin. That regardless of uh, of how long we've been a Christian or where we've come from, we need to understand that we all sin. In fact, the Bible says that all have sin and fall short of God's glory. So the, the, the sin that you deal with or the temptation that you struggle with, it, it's, not, it's not specific only to you. That all of us have sin. All of us mess up. All of us make mistakes. All of us fall short. And, and if we go around thinking like, oh man, I'm never going to grow because I, I'm the only one dealing with this thing. We need to understand that all of us sin have sinned, and as we walk with God, all of us do sin. I've said this before, and it's kind of cheesy, so forgive me, I'm going to say it again. But the goal for Christians is not to be sinless. It's to sin less. You with me? Like, we're, 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 not, gonna, we're not gonna ever get to a day... You, you guys waited way too long to clap for that. That was disingenuous. All right. Um, but the goal as we walk with God is not that we're, 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 we're not going to be perfect, right? You're never going to just be like, okay, that's it. I don't sin anymore. I've graduated the sin part of my journey. But the goal is as we grow to be able to overcome and withstand things that maybe at one point we couldn't overcome. And so the goal is that we would sin less and less as we grow in our relationship with God. But we all sin and we'll all continue to sin. But the promise of the cross, the promise of Jesus is that all of our sin has been forgiven. Past, present, and future sin is covered in what Jesus did on the cross. And so part of recognizing who we are in Jesus is recognizing that we've been forgiven and that we can walk in victory. That we realize that we are, we, we can live free from guilt and condemnation from our sin. And so often what keeps people bound is the feeling of guilt because they keep sinning. Now the goal is to grow out of it. I'm not saying, okay, because you're forgiven, you can do whatever you want. But what I am saying is that you don't have to feel bound or crippled or, 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 or bogged down because you've made a mistake or you continue to make a mistake. We've been forgiven. There's forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And so we need to recognize we all sin, we all continue to sin, and that we need to allow God's word to correct you and guide you through what you struggle with. God's word, as you open it up, as you read it, as we gather together and as we look at it, God's word will correct you and will guide you through your mistakes. It will, it will challenge you. Hey, this part of your life or this what you're doing or this, this behavior is not acceptable. Okay, what do we do with that? How do we get through it? How do we overcome it? How do we get to the other side of it? And we do that really by focusing on Jesus and what he wants you to do. We don't focus on not sinning. I think sometimes we, we, we sort of know our areas that we struggle with, right? Maybe it's like, Okay, this is my, uh, my struggle. It's lust. Or this is my struggle. It's, it's, it's being uh, like blowing up at people and getting mad. Or this is my struggle. It's, it's, not, it's self-worth and I think of myself too lowly. Our, our goal is not to go, okay, I need to think. Okay, I can't think about that so much. Stop thinking about that. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't think about that. No, no, no. That just gets us stuck. What we need to do is focus on what God's called us to do and begin doing that. One of the ways you, you overcome bad habits is by replacing it with good habits, right? That's just like a practical thing. You watch YouTube, like how to make your life better. They, they tell you something like that. Like replace bad habits with good habits. And the same is true in our spiritual formation. It's, it's not just focusing on what we're not supposed to do, 
It's to begin to focus on our life in Christ and what God has called us to do. And one of the best ways to overcome personal sin is to buy, is start serving other people. Because it focuses you to get fo- it forces you to stop all of your focus on yourself. Okay, so one of the things personal is overcoming sin and having spiritual growth. The second thing that is sort of in the questions that we talked about personally is knowing what God wants us to do. One of the things that makes walking with God difficult, part of it is our own personal sin, our struggles, our failures, our mistakes. The other thing that makes, uh, and, sorry, I'm gonna go back. I just had a thought on that point before I walked away from it. I literally think like that, though. I'm like, okay, it's over here. Here's the thought. Um, oh, it's, I'm losing it. It's gone. All right. <clears throat> oh, no, no, I found it. Okay. <laughs> Part of what makes it difficult is not only the fact that we struggle, but also the consequences that come as a result of our sin. Because part of the the, part of the reality of being forgiven from Jesus because of faith in him is you are forgiven. But sin and mistakes usually almost always lead to consequence. Right? So you need to understand that from heaven's perspective and from your relationship with God and being born again and being the person that God has created you to be, you are forgiven. But as we sin in like time and space, planet earth, human relationships, there's consequences. And so part of what makes it difficult, our own personal sin, is guilt and condemnation, but also consequences. So recognizing that, okay, moving on to the second thought, is that we also, what makes it difficult is knowing what God wants us to do. Or in other words, discerning God's will, right? That's a, that's a big question. We talk, about, we talk about that God has a plan and a purpose for our life. And the big question then is, what is it? How do I find it? Where do I go? What, what does it look like? Well, I'd say three things on this idea. One, and I've said this before, but I think it's so important that we understand it. In order to find God's specific will, we have to walk in his general will. In other words, God gives us all, as Christians, instruction. This is what we're called to do. We're called to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, right? We're we're, we're called to love our neighbor. We're called to love our enemy. There's things that we're all called to do. And as we do God's general will, which we would all fit into, he begins to reveal to us our specific will, sort of what specific area in the general will that God wants you to walk in. So as you do the general, God will reveal the specific. But if we're so focused on finding God's specific will for our life, and we're not walking in the general will, we'll be really confused. And so it's important for us. Okay, what has God told me as a Christian to do? Okay, I can start at home. I'm supposed to honor my parents. Okay, I'll do that. I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Well, the closest person to me is my sibling, so I'm gonna love them. I'm I'm called to love my enemy. Okay, who's somebody at school or or work or even in my house that I've been not uh, getting along with or has been rubbing me the wrong way? How can I love them? How can I pray for them? How can I show them the love of God? Okay, I've been called to preach the gospel or share the message of Jesus. Are there people in my world, whether they follow me on social media or they're in my classroom or at my work, how can I show them the love of God? You start... Right, start at home, work your way out, begin to walk in God's general will, and all of a sudden you'll think, do you know what? As I've been walking with God, and as I've been loving my neighbor and loving my enemy, and as I've been sharing the gospel with people, I think that this way to do it is what really excites me and fires me up. And this is, and I think the best way for me to show the love of God to people is, is in the college classroom because I feel like in that, in that space, I, 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 maybe it's an intellectual way. I feel like I can show the love of God that way. Maybe for some it's like, oh, I don't like that. I, I feel like when I'm working with my hands and working with other people, I find just natural ways that God gets brought up and we can talk about it and I can show the love of God that way. For me, it's, it, it's man, when I'm playing music and, I, and I'm in a band and I've got other people, some of them don't know God, but as I play music, it seems like the music and these things kind of open doors for conversation for the gospel. 
what I'm saying is, is God places you in specific places and using your specific gifts and talents and interests and opportunity, God opens up doors to do what he wants to do, which is to show the love of God to the world. And so discerning God's will is not like, okay, God's will for my life is this college. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. That's not usually how God reveals his will to us. How God reveals his will to us is how can you show the love of God to the people in your world? And maybe for you, it is that college. It is that sports team. It is that work environment. And then we step in that and we live the way God wants us to live. So yes, we discern God's will by walking in his general will. All right, moving on. I'm running out of time. The second sort of category of things that we found difficult to walk with God was not just personal things, but it was secondly people, or uh, not us, but others. It's people. Verse 2 of Ephesians 2 said, in which, talking about the world, you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay, two thoughts on people that make it difficult to walk with God. First is culture or following the course of this world. We live in a world that is opposed to God and the things of God. So just existing as a Christian in this world is difficult, right? Because basically what we're called to do is there is a course. He says it. There's a flow of this world that is going one direction. It is, it is, going to, it is flowing one place. And then the follower of Jesus is called to go in opposition to that. You're not going that way. And so just purely by that alone, it makes your life difficult. I remember one time I was surfing at Sebastian Inlet. And I was, I was on the south side. I don't know why I was doing this. I can't remember. But I was on the south side of the inlet. If you've ever been to Sebastian Inlet, you go over a bridge, and there's the inlet in the, in the middle, and there's two jetties, one on the south side, one on the north side. And I was on the south side, and for whatever reason, I thought it would be a good idea to paddle from the south side over to the north side. It's pretty far, and also the inlet, it rips, the tide rips in and out really, really fast. And so I jumped in, if, if you're familiar with that, I, I walked down underneath the bridge towards the river, probably like, a, a, like, probably like 100 yards on the other side of the bridge. And then my goal was to paddle straight across. And I jumped in, and it honestly looked like, you know those like moving sidewalks at the airport and stuff? It was like that. Like I got in the water, and I wanted to go that way, and I'm going like this. <laughs> and I'm full on. I go through underneath the bridge, and all of a sudden I'm like getting like getting sucked out to sea fast. And so I'm scratching as hard as I can to get across, across uh, to the other side. And before I got to the very end of the jetty, there's a, there's a little like bank that you can walk in on and I just barely make it across to the other side. And, and paddling as hard as I can against the current, trying to get across. And that honestly is what walking with God in our culture sometimes feels like. She's like, okay, that's my direction. And there's so much opposition, so much force going away from me. What my friends are into, what I'm seeing on social media, what's popular, where everyone's going. It's this rapid force against us, and we're called to go ah, in a different direction. And so just existing in our world makes it difficult because we live in a culture. And, and I'm not saying specific people are necessarily evil or trying to get you to go some crazy way. But just naturally, the bent of our world is flowing in opposition to God. And so John tells us what we read in 1 John to sort of warn us against this is all that the world has to offer. So what is the culture all about? He said it's about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, it's impure passion, it's possession, and it's position or power. And so he warns us, hey, do not love the world or the culture or the, or the sway, the flow of this world because it's going in a direction and all that it is is impure passion, possessions, and position or power. And he warns us that those things aren't going to satisfy us. 
But sometimes what makes walking with God so difficult is we're called to go over there and there's a flow, there's a course that is rapidly pulling us in a different way. And then I think a second part of people that make walking with God difficult is when we attempt to live to please people rather than living to please God. We need to recognize that as Christians, we're not supposed to live for the approval of people. There's an interesting story in the book of Acts, and, and maybe you were here when we studied that series on it, or we studied that book on the series Church on Fire. But there's a story where uh, the Apostle Paul and a guy named Barnabas show up to a city and they preach the gospel. And before they preach the gospel, or while they're preaching the gospel, they heal somebody. God does this miraculous work through them, and this person gets healed. And the people in this city are, are, are blown away. They're shocked by the fact that Paul and Barnabas are able to heal this person. And so in shock and in, and in wonder, they begin to worship Paul and Barnabas as if they're gods. In fact, they call them Zeus and, uh, oh, what's the other one? Zeus and Aramis, that's who it was. Um, so they begin to worship him. And, and Paul and Barnabas stop them and are like, no, 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 don't worship us. We're not gods. Like, the only reason we're able to do this is because God, it, the real God did it. And so then they don't like that news, the people. They don't like that news. So they decide they're going to kill them instead. <laughs> and in this moment, they go from worshiping them as gods to killing them because they think they're crazy. And I think it is the most vivid illustration about how the opinions of people work. One moment, you're awesome. One moment, you're the best. One moment, we think you're great. Then the next, you're dead to me. And it switches so fast. And if we're living for the approval of people, if that's our goal, it's gonna ebb and flow and we're gonna be disappointed. But when we're living for the approval of God, whose mind never changes, who is for you all, always, who, who sees you and knows you and loves you regardless of the ups and downs, when we can shift our mind that we're not living for the approval of people, but we're living for the approval of God whose opinion never changes, we can find consistency in our life. So if you can break out of the shift of going, okay, I need to be constantly worried about what people think about me because it ebbs and flows, it changes day in and day out. But God's view of you or opinion of you never changes. Okay, final thing. And a worship team, you can make your way back up here. Personal things that make it difficult. Other people that make it difficult. And then the third thing, I just called it pain. Pain that makes walking with God difficult. Not everything... Not everything goes right for the Christian. Have you ever noticed this? Not everything goes right for a Christian. I think sometimes we, we, we've been sold like a, uh, uh, maybe like a half gospel, where this gospel that just tells you, this, this message of Jesus that tells you like, walk with God and life will be perfect. Like walk with God and everything will just be wonderful all the time. And we're like, okay, yeah, that's what we signed up. Wonderful all the time. And then you live for about five seconds and you're like, that's not true. It's hard, it's difficult, there's pain, there's disappointment, there's hurt. And so what happens when, when this is the case, what we think is that God's not good or God's not for me or God's, God's not with me and our, our difficulty, our pain then shifts our view of God. Because what happens is we confuse the favor of God and success in the world. We confuse, listen to me, we confuse the favor of God and what that is with success in the world. Success in the world or success in our, in our experience in life is things like money, fame, health, easy living. And we think, okay, that must be the favor of God. The favor of God must mean money, 
fame, health, easy living. It must be the favor of God. So then, when we're broke, nobody knows us or likes us, we're sick or people we love are sick, and life is hard, we're like, wait a second, I must not have the favor of God. Or God's making this difficult. Or God must not really love me. Or God must be mad at me. Or maybe I made too many mistakes and now God is, is, is cursing me for all the things that I've done. And that's why I don't have any of these things. The favor of God is not that. The favor of God is purpose, identity, security, salvation. The favor of God is different. Listen, this is what I'm trying to say. When we have the correct definition of success, we can understand when things are going wrong or right. We have the wrong definition of success. We think that God's favor is this. And we're like, no, nah, that's not God's favor. That's just, that's just what our world describes as success or what we might imagine success being. God's favor is bigger than that. And so what we have to do, listen to me, this will make walking with God easier when you have the right definition of success. How? Well, because you won't limit your success or your relationship with God or how things are going with God based upon material things. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand that God is, works in the spiritual realm or the ways we can't see? And so to connect the favor of God specifically or only to material possessions or, or, or circumstances or life like that, we're missing something big time. Let me go back in, in the, the verses we read in Ephesians. It says this. I've got to find it. Okay, and God, here, here is God's favor. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Notice that. That God has riches that are incomparable to human experience. And so if we equate the favor of God with what we experience on planet earth, we're going to miss something big time. So we got to have the correct definition of success. And then the final thing I want to say just on pain is why continue to walk with God if it seems easier to just give up? Ever felt like that? Like maybe we're going, the, just the sheer question of alone, alone, what makes it so difficult to walk with God? Maybe your answer is everything. Everything makes it difficult to walk with God. And maybe there's a part of you in your mind that just says, do you know what, if I just gave up on God, if I just started doing things however I feel and the way that I want it, my life would be so much easier. And let me tell you, that is a very real thought that many people have. Man, I'm over this. I'm so sick and tired of this. People are mean. I'm not getting it. I'm not moving anywhere. Nothing's happening. I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I don't feel like I have purpose. I'm stuck in this thing. So why am I going through? Why am I trying so hard to do what God wants me to do if I just feel stuck in the same old stuff? So I'm just going to give up and do not my life will be so much easier. And sometimes we feel like it would be easier or better if we stopped being a Christian. Let me read one more verse. We read it already. 1 John 2.14. It says this. The world and its desires, they pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires passes away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. For the Christian, I've said this before, I want to say it again. For the Christian, this is the hardest life will ever be. 
For the non-Christian, the person that gives up or rejects God, this is the best it will ever be. We have hope and expectation that although this might all pass away, and it will all pass away, but when we do the will of God, we will live with him forever and we'll find what he has for us forever. Listen, rejecting God does not mean your life will be free from hurt. But it does mean it will be free from hope. Rejecting God, if you say, okay, I'm done. I I give up. I'm not walking with God anymore. This is too hard. Let me tell you, it does not mean your life is going to be free from hurt. You will still have pain. This probably the same pain that Christians experience. It does mean, I can guarantee, it will be free from hope. And biblical hope is not wishful thinking hope. It's an expectation that God will do what he said he's going to do. That if God promised you joy and peace and favor and salvation and identity and the riches of the treasures of heaven and the riches of his grace, let me tell you, if God said it, he's going to do it. And so when things pass away and life gets difficult, God is with us through it all. And so the, 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 the thought for us is if you're like, okay, I'm gonna give up, what you'll find yourself, where you'll find yourself is hopeless. I've got no hope. This is, this is all I'm ever gonna know. This is it, this pain or this difficulty or this frustration. The promise of the follower of Jesus is hope in the midst of it and hope that we'll get through it. Hope in the midst of it and hope that we'll get through it. Whatever you're walking through, there's hope in the midst of it. God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And hope and expectation that God's going to get you through it. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to leave you behind. And so when you have this thought of, I'm going to just give up, all you're doing is saying, I am going to let go of the only hope that I have. That's in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you love us. And uh, we thank you that you have a plan for us. We ask God that you would help us to see things the way that you see them. And Lord, as we sort of began this series in pretty uh, kind of heavy topic, why walking with you is so difficult. It'd be easier to give up or, or if it wasn't for them or if it wasn't for this, I would find everything that I'm looking for. But Lord, we want to recognize that there is a, there's, there's something beyond our control or beyond what we can see that's going on. And we also want to recognize that there's hope found in you. So we look to you, God, for hope. I want to ask you tonight, this, maybe you're here tonight and you have, you've given up on God. You've in your mind, you've said, do you know what, God's, God's not there. It would be easier for me to just do my own thing. And maybe you've come back tonight because you, you are, or you're here tonight because you're realizing, man, it's hopeless. And you want to come back in a sense. You want to surrender your life completely to Jesus to say, okay, I want all that you have. If that's you, eyes closed, heads bowed, I'm going to look so I know who I'm praying for. But if you're here tonight and that's you, could you raise up your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you, Lord. Thanks, God. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Yeah. Thanks, Lord. God, you see these hands. God, you know their situation, and you know what maybe has caused the hurt that they've felt or maybe the, the, the difficulty that they've walked through. But God, we thank you that you are for us. God, you have a plan for us. And Lord, you see us and you open us or you receive us back with open arms. And Lord, we have hope and expectation that you are gonna be with us through whatever we walk through. And we have an expectation that we will get through it. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, it might not be 10 years from now, it might not even be in this lifetime. But God, we have an expectation and hope that you will make all things good. So we trust you. Help us to walk with you in Jesus' name. Amen.